All right, so it's quite obvious with the global pandemic and hyper-connectivity hyper has accelerated. However, hyper-vulnerability has no doubt, and it sets into. At this today's power session, we will look at rethinking cybersecurity strategies and re-evaluating security models to create a culture of cyber resiliency by rewriting security roadmaps to transform businesses in 2021. We are very humbled and honoured to have a very powerful panel who will grace today's opening power panel. At first, guest panellist is Mr. Abid Adam, the Group Chief Risk and Compliance Officer of Axiata. Abid has over 16 years of industry experience in risk management, cybersecurity and privacy from multiple continents. Our second guest panellist is dialing in all the way from Singapore. He has over 20 years of experience in the information and cybersecurity and IT management. He is Murari Kalyana Ramani, currently the Executive Director of Cybersecurity Services at Standard Chartered Bank. Also dialing in is a very special guest from the Malaysian Communications and Multimedia Commission. He is Chairman of MCMC and he has more than 22 years of experience, holding several senior positions in public and private sector. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Fadullah Sohaimi. And moderating the panel is our very own Asuhan Aryadurai, who is the senior editor of The Star Online. Asuhan is no stranger to the local and regional tech ecosystem. All right, the panel is getting ready, so please stay tuned. We'll be back in just a short while. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the lovely introduction, Myra. Uh, and welcome to our pow power panel, Reengineering Security in the Next Normal. Uh, you've already been introduced to our guests, so I'm going to get right to it and uh, first ask them to explain about what they do and uh, what their charters are in their respective organizations. So I'll start with you, Abit, since you're here. All right. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Sohan and the fellow panelists. I hope you're all keeping well and assalamu alaikum to everybody. My name is Abed Adam. I am the Group Chief Risk and Compliance Officer for Asiata. And uh, my key responsibilities, I, I look after the four key areas, which is cybersecurity, data privacy, uh, compliance, ethics, integrity, and enterprise risk management. So that's what keeps me awake, and that's what has made me lose all my hair. Yes, thank you. Hi, right, thanks. Murari, can you go next? Yeah, hi. Uh, Murari here, and uh, I currently head Global Application and Infrastructure Security for Standard Chartered Bank, uh, and that coverage uh, extends to our global footprint. Uh, so it's 70 countries, around 1,200 over offices and branches, uh, and protecting over 87,000 employees. Okay, thank you. Dr. Farullah, you have uh, uh, the stage. <laughs> Right. Yours, is the uh, most, yours will be the, I think, most looked forward to. <laughs> uh, hi, hi, good morning. and uh, to, to Asohan and fellow panelists and everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm currently heading uh, MCMC, uh, the Mission Communications and Multimedia Commission. Uh, we pretty much, uh, our remit uh, falls under the Act of uh, Communications and Multimedia Act that covers the industries of telecommunications, broadcasting, postal and courier as well as Digital Signature Act. So that pretty much covers uh, the whole uh, gamut of uh, what's online. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, now we go straight into some of the questions that we uh, or areas we'd like to explore. And of course, first in everyone's mind is the global pandemic and how it has changed the way we live and the way we do business. So I'd like the panelists to start off by talking about uh, how has it changed the cybersecurity landscape specifically. Uh, I think I will start with uh, you, Abit. Can you tell us what you what your organization was doing before and uh, quickly go into how the pandemic has changed, if anything, how you work and how you approach cybersecurity for your own organization? Thank you, Sohan. So I think more than change, I think there are a few things that has expanded or accelerated. Number one, and number two, there are new things that we're seeing uh, evolving faster. So allow me to elaborate three key items that I think I see personally what has evolved. Number one, if you're talking about from a cybersecurity perspective, I think it's an increase in broader attack landscape. All right, and I'll elaborate again. Yeah, you're going to have to explain that one. <laughs> yeah. now, I would like to just outline the three and then I'll explain the, the details behind it. So the number one was increase in broader attack landscape. 
Number two was the issue of data privacy, as you mentioned. So disclosure or protecting thereof has now been even more important than before, right? And then last is more sort of on a virtual meeting fatigue, but that leads to cyber attacks also because people now are click, maybe clicking on links, uh, they are tired, uh, and they see a lot of emails coming through. And this has been proven with the facts we've seen significant increase in phishing attacks globally. FBI reported 300% increase. Cybersecurity Malaysia has reported similar increase in number of phishing attacks. So I think those are kind of things that we have seen, not it's new, but it has increased because of the very nature of the pandemic itself. Allow me to elaborate on item one, which I've uh, shared with you, which is increase in broader attack landscape. What I mean by that is, if you look at the concept of work in office versus work from home, when you work in office, generally your infrastructure is adequately secure and managed by the relevant technical functions. When you're working from home, the very router that you use or the network equipment you use to connect to the office network is not managed by your IT department. So somebody who maybe have bought a router, a cheapest one that they wanted to, and those cheapest router has a default password admin admin, or sometimes doesn't even have admin password, it's completely blank. But that now becomes uh, your security team's responsibility ensuring that that infrastructure is protected because that is how that person is connecting into your environment. So that has obviously increased the things we need to protect, the things we need to look out and also train our users around how do you make sure that that becomes part of a broader ecosystem. So I'll pause there, Sohan, and yeah, share this with you. Ravi, uh, do you have anything you'd like to add to this? Uh, yeah, I think I think leveraging what uh, Abid was saying, the the attack surface, right? So I think uh, you know um, from a business standpoint, I think there's been more reliance on leveraging digital channels to provide services, and I think this is not just uh, with banking, but even consumer goods. So a lot of organizations had had to pivot from you know traditional brick and mortar kind of operations. So you take banks where you know branches, for example, uh, a number of countries had to be shut down. And that pivoted a lot of uh, push of features, capabilities, and service through mobile channels. So that became suddenly a very attractive uh, attack surface because there's more opportunities there to to exploit. I think the the other thing to add there as well is um, you know more adoption of cloud technology because I think a lot of infrastructure and application teams to to not only support the business but also customers uh, had to scale very quickly. So the adoption of you know, cloud technology, you know, working with partners like, you know, AWS and Azure, for example, has again, you know, changed the attack surface from, you know, sitting behind our networks to actually extending our networks into the, the public domain. I think on the on the threat, um, on the threat perspective, I mean, again, you know, I won't repeat what, what Abid had said. I think I agree with those points. But I think, you know, what, what COVID has also done is sort of heighten the awareness and monitoring around insider threats. And what do I mean by that? I think with economic conditions as such, you know, uh, organizations, you know, potentially having to retrench employees, reduce benefits, reduce salaries, bonus, you know, there's probably increased motivation for for employees who are impacted, who have actually very, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, increased access to systems to actually uh, commit fraudulent activities. So I think insider yeah, threat is definitely one thing. Employee, the yeah. whole disgruntled employee thing. Correct. So I think that that has also taken a heightened importance to to keep a close eye on as well. Yep. Okay, thank you. Dr. Fadula. I mean, being with MCMC, I'm not so much interested in how your organi organization has approached the work from home in the global pandemic, but how you as the industry regulator uh, see the landscape changing. What do you think uh, MCMC uh, can do about it? I mean, has there been increase in complaints about cybersecurity uh, breaches? Have there been increase in complaints about or oh, demands for greater broadband access and all? And how are you going to approach this? Yeah, I think the co uh, what has happened with uh, COVID-19 is that uh, there is a increased uh, usage of internet, all right? Uh, everybody seems to be online today, uh, even uh, the, the Machi at home uh, who would have never uh, ordered food for lunch now orders food via grab okay so that is really something different that we we've never seen before okay so what has happened is that more and more people are getting online and therefore more and more people are being exposed okay uh, so on two on two fronts one they're not online they want better quality 
Okay, and uh, today uh, the quality of service uh, need not necess necessarily be uh, at the distribution that used to be uh, pre uh, pre COVID because uh, many of us would have been in offices uh, as opposed to uh, being at home uh, during uh, the normal working hours. So therefore, the network is now challenged because it it has to do a lot of rebalancing uh, to make sure that the traffic is being done uh, uh, is being uh, balanced properly so that the quality of service improves and that is where our biggest challenge is today uh, we get a lot of complaints uh, more so on coverage uh, less on cyber security okay a lot on uh, fake news where people will put a lot of fear uh, into everyone because uh, as you see uh, people are now online uh, they have access to uh, platforms uh, they think they they would like to add their own content into it, and therefore we have to work uh, extra hours uh, to uh, oversee a lot of complaints with regards to questionable uh, content that comes through. So if I were to rank uh, between uh, complaints on connectivity, uh, fake news or fake content, uh, and uh, cybersecurity, at least uh, what comes to our door, uh, it's one, two, and three in that order. Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, Murari and Abit, you're both speaking uh, from the perspective of big companies where you have your own IT security teams and departments to look into this. Uh, the problem is right now a lot of smaller companies, SMEs and all that, have had to introduce work from home policies. They don't have an IT department. Sometimes they don't even have an IT person. Uh, how, can you give us some ideas or suggestions for them how to approach cybersecurity? if they go fully into work from home or even partially into work from home, what are the areas they have to watch out for? You were talking about routers and home networks and all that. That's one. What does your CEO of a small five-man company do? How, how should they approach it? The 20-man company, the 100-man company, what are the issues they have to face? I saw you, Abin. Yeah, I think whether you're a large company or a 10 or 100-man company, I think there are certain things that are universally applicable. Right, so I would start off with attackers does not discriminate. Uh, we, we basically, they throw a net as wide as possible and catch as many fish as possible. So if we are looking at it from a small, medium enterprise perspective, things that they can do uh, and doesn't cost a lot of money is first and foremost the awareness and education. Simple things on social engineering because that's where even the big companies unfortunately gets uh, trapped. Right, so the awareness on phishing and there's a lot of free material available Cybersecurity in Malaysia, Nexa, all of the, these agencies, government agencies also provides that. So I think that's what the good start that, that they should do because I think that will prevent quite a bit of a problem. Secondly, I think it's more about an understanding where are those uh, SMEs are quite exposed. So if you're talking about matches or going through uh, some online platform, that an online platform provider needs to ensure if that's the source of its greatest revenue, make sure that that's protected. So they don't have to do everything, but at least protect that quite strongly. Last but not least, uh, and this is a very small matter, but actually very important matter. A lot of the time attackers use social engineering techniques. And the simple way to do it, example, is I could phone you at home and say, I'm phoning from your IT help desk. Let me take over your computer. And suddenly you see the mouse cursor moving and then they are taking over your computer. And you, you, you may think that that's stupid or sounds silly, but that's really what happens. So even if you are a small enterprise, having a simple protocol that if your IT help desk calls you, this is the protocol it will follow. If it doesn't follow this, then there's something wrong. It will save you and go a long way. So I think I'll pause there because these are some very practical things you can do. Okay. Murari, you have anything to add? Yeah, I think uh, definitely. I think, uh, you know, for, for a smallish company or an SME, I think the, the, the fundamental decision they need to make is, you know, do we buy or do we build? Right? Do we buy the capability or build our own? And I think in most cases now the, the landscape is such that you know a lot of the the products or services you know one obtains or purchases comes with security in uh, you know embedded as native uh, capabilities like you know cloud for example. So I think definitely you know uh, buying would would be would be good. You know, however, just to extend on on Abid's point as well, I think you know some of the some of the factors which would you know sort of apply you know irrespective of size of company would be that, you know, they should never compromise on, you know, the cyber hygiene controls. And a lot of these are basic IT controls, which have always been there. For example, you know, know what your assets are, know what your connections are, 
because you know if you don't know what your attack surface or assets are you know you don't know how to protect them right i think the second thing is also to ensure that you know in the event you're, you're buying or building is the technology life cycle is also very important because i think a lot of organizations struggle with legacy technology which is not kept up to date and it becomes very expensive to to maintain end of support or end of life systems and more importantly you know a lot of these end of life or end of uh, support systems you know can't accept for example security patches and that would be my last point you know um, a lot of people talk about the sophistication of cyber attacks and threats but if you look at the actual you know vectors they are exploiting these are basic things which have always been there right the end user over email and phishing um, you know exploiting uh, unpatched systems so i think cyber hygiene is you know should be maintained um, at, at all costs in that sense yeah, most most attacks are brute force attacks, and too many people are still using Windows ninety five machines, and <laughs> especially yep. in the small and medium uh, enterprise space. Yeah. Doctor Fadlula, yeah. I mean, uh, I was just thinking, uh, uh, you your team MCMC has done tremendous work with the Banania uh, website, you know, where you're debunking a lot of fake news, uh, and this provides a lot of guidance for people. Have you guys considered doing something for cybersecurity in terms of uh, small small organizations moving towards a work from home policy uh, environment uh, guidance on what do you need to do step by step uh, what are the areas you have to watch out for and putting it somewhere on your website uh, yeah uh, <clears throat> one of the things that we're looking at uh, is that uh, but just to correct you uh, today uh, with regards to the advisory uh, on cyber security uh, there is an organization called the cyber security Malaysia that undertakes yep. that so the last thing we want to do is uh, to actually duplicate uh, anyone's uh, work, okay? But certainly we uh, we are more than happy to amplify, uh, and uh, we are actually uh, putting together a uh, a set of uh, activities undertaken by a variety of uh, agencies uh, within the uh, the space of cybersecurity, which uh, we will uh, be uh, announcing soon. The minister did allude to it uh, roughly about a couple uh, about a week back that, that uh, there's this thing this thing that she's going to mention. Uh, it's pretty much putting together things uh, that we have done before, uh, things that had been done but probably people didn't quite care about uh, because at that point in time cybersecurity is just something like okay yeah fine uh, cybersecurity uh, I'm not a tech guy so I don't care. But today because uh, people uh, people are afraid so probably it. it uh, it relates to them better, and therefore we're just pulling that all together and putting it out there yet again so that people will understand. Uh, so just like we did uh, with uh, Subana.my, for a while people thought uh, Subana.my uh, is quite dead and gone, but until uh, COVID-19 came, came about and people started to come up with uh, funny, funny news, uh, be it uh, how to treat uh, COVID-19 and stuff like that, uh, and th therefore we had to then uh, ramp up and I think we went through this uh, truth campaign uh, recently uh, just to get people back on track and to appreciate that fake news is not good news you know, so uh, likewise uh, for cybersecurity we will be doing and undertaking the same soon okay thank you uh so you know um this is the season everyone's talking about budget 2021 mm -hmm. uh a lot of uh, uh areas uh there's, there, there, there are elements of cybersecurity in budget 2021. Uh, we do know that uh, uh, earlier this year, uh, before COVID-19 itself, there, there were a couple of research reports that shows that you know, we have a lack of cybersecurity experts in this country, and it's quite critical. And, you know, uh, I would like to know, and we'll start with you, Murari, fair warning. Uh, what do you think of the budget in terms of cybersecurity and the areas it pays attention to? Uh, where do you think we should focus more attention on what what is missing in budget 2021 in terms of cyber security and not just talking about for businesses but also for uh, consumers yeah i think you know what i would say is you know i would i would first say that you know it's very important that the government has taken the step to set aside some money um, for for cyber security and i think that was recognition that it's important enough that it needs to be addressed i think what what you know the advice i would give to everyone is that you know, um, and when I say that is, you know, all types of organizations, whether it's public sector or private sector, 
you know, people shouldn't sit back and say that, okay, now it's the government's responsibility. They have the money. They need to go and solve all the cyber issues in the country, right? It's everyone's responsibility and that the money which is set aside is not the silver bullet, right? So each organization who makes up the entire ecosystem in Malaysia has a role to play. Um, so everybody needs to take the responsibility to assess their risk and set aside the budget. Um, and I think the second thing I would like to stress there is that, you know, again, I think what we need to see more of is actually public and private sector collaboration and information sharing around threats. I think everybody sees uh, different types of attacks, uh, you know, gets different types of threat intelligence. I think it's very important as an ecosystem, public and private sector, there's a lot of more collaboration and information sharing. I think in terms of, you know, focus, I think you brought up a point around the, the talent issue, right? And I think there's there's two ways to look at it. So I think from a, from a pipeline or talent pipeline uh, perspective, I think there are already steps being taken and Standard Chartered has worked with Cybersecurity Malaysia in the past to, to help with that ecosystem development. And, you know, I'm, I'm aware that CSM works with a number of uh, institutions of higher learning in Malaysia to sort of develop that next uh, breed of, of cybersecurity specialists you know, targeting various uh, domains uh, within cybersecurity. So that's very good. But I think the challenge remains that that's pipeline and that will help us solve uh, a problem in the future when we have talent gaps. But I think the, the we have a problem now and, and that, you know, really that's where organizations need to be a bit more agile and, you know, look at other options to, to fill that gap. Thank you. Ab Abhi, you like, I'll go with you, Dr. Farula, last so that you can address some of the points that the two gentlemen bring up. Yeah, thank, sure. Thank, I think just continuing on Marari's point there, um, I think it's first of all a good good start. It's not the quantity of the, the amount allocated, but it's the message that's been sent out that cybersecurity is important, the government's taking it important, and it certainly has increased a sort of a spotlight. As you may be aware, recently Nexa also released uh, the cybersecurity strategy for the country. So it's good to see that the various agencies, CSM, Nexa, and you know Asiata works very closely with all of our partners in government agencies and non-government agencies to strengthen the cybersecurity resilience for, for Malaysia. If you are then looking at in terms of things that, uh, I think the issue about the expertise is not Malaysia specific. I think this is a global issue. Uh, I don't think any country can claim that they have produced enough cyber experts to meet the demands. and. In a short term at the moment, of course, that issue will continue and it may be even exacerbate a lot more given the COVID situation and more adoption of digital technologies. So what do we do about it? Similar to what uh, Morari has mentioned is partnership with the universities. I personally have been to uh, some of the universities, UP, uh, you know, Asia Pacific one, UPNM and so forth. But I feel that there should be some level of bridging the gap between the even the university students coming out. Because the challenge you find in, in reality is you find the university students come up, they may be a university fit, but not really business fit. So it's how do we accelerate and close that gap so they can be more productive from day one. Uh, and I think those are some of the programs we're working with some of the agencies on and some of the even non-government agency like MDEC, uh, non-profit agency, sorry, like MDEC to close those gaps. So I think I'll pause there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Farlula? Yeah, uh, yeah, you're right. The, the message on cybersecurity uh, has been mentioned, okay, uh, which is great. Uh, in fact, I think the, the bigger message is that the country is moving down the digital economy uh, in uh, at a faster pace uh, as opposed to what it used to, to talk about, simply because uh, that is probably what's available to, to the country in trying to get us out of this economic uh, challenge that we are now faced with, okay. And uh, in relation to that, uh, there have been... Uh, with, uh, in terms of uh, how much funds are being put aside, uh, again, funds will always be uh, pulled from uh, with uh, ver uh, varying priorities. Uh, there's some amount being made available to CSM, but I think what's missing that people may not realize is that, uh, as pointed out by uh, you know my two panelists, uh, what is it that we should do as an individual? And actually, there's a lot uh, that we can do uh, simply. Uh, subscribing to uh, protection services, okay, uh, to which that is a form of tax relief that you can actually get uh, under your lifestyle tax relief that you get uh, year in, year out. But most of us don't, don't do that. We, do, we use it for some other things. So uh, it's a, 
uh, all these tools uh, are already there. Uh, what's important is uh, people need to understand uh, the need for cybersecurity. And again, within the organizations, uh, don't, don't just look at the uh, budget per se. Remember, prior to the budget, uh, there was also the announcement on the Prihatin program uh, and the Panjana program, uh, within which both uh, had components of digitalization for the small, medium industries. And again, uh, cybersecurity would be embedded within uh, that availability of that grant for them to use. So again, uh, the, the funds are being made available. You probably won't get a freebie from the government uh, uh, you know, all the way, but certainly uh, it has uh, made people realize the importance of cybersecurity. Uh, there is assistance to some extent for them. And with regards to uh, skill, uh, the workforce, uh, unfortunately, uh, as Abid pointed out, it's a global problem. Okay, uh, we can't resolve it overnight. But one thing I would like to uh, request uh, uh, for most companies that today technology moves very, very fast. And if you expect uh, students coming out of universities uh, are actually ready uh, to jump into the deep end of the pool, uh, I think uh, we are sadly misguided because the business requirements differ from uh, one place to another. Levels of uh, adoption is different from one place to another. And when the uni students come out, they are probably not work ready, but they are ready for work. Okay. So, and it is actually the, uh, the task falls on uh, uh, the businesses to actually quickly uh, train them up uh, in during the induction. We, and this is something that, that seems to be missing. And it's just not for cybersecurity, but uh, many uh, you know, parts of uh, the disciplines, uh, be it uh, you know, even in management per se, uh, people expect things to just uh, happen just because someone is a graduate. So I think to, uh, things have moved. Uh, we, are, we are no longer trained in the discipline that we are trained in, and we get to work in the discipline that we are trained in. Uh, we, we all have to, to learn to adapt, and therefore companies need to also uh, help uh, build that uh, bridge for that. And lastly, I think um, I'd like to also touch uh, on uh, the uh, PPP uh, approach, okay, uh, the, the public-private partnership that Murali, uh, you, you mentioned about. Uh, yes, I do believe that uh, we probably need to do a lot more engagement. Uh, I know NAXA uh, does a fair bit of engagement together with CSM. Uh, question is, uh, do we have uh, a very big group? I, I remember years ago when internet uh, just came to the fore and the banking industry uh, just kind of like got around the fact that you can do things on, online. Uh, I used to be in the in, in the uh, internet banking ta banking task force uh, years ago. Uh, and that brought all the bank, uh, the banks, uh, you know, together, together with the uh, agencies. Uh, I was not with MCMC then, but I was in with one of the service providers, uh, and we were there together to, to kind of like help each other uh, to see where uh, where are the gaps and how can we actually help. And I think that's a, a, a model. Uh, personally, I'll, I'll take it on uh, uh, to you know to bring it with an AXA because under the digital economy that I mentioned about, uh, there is a cluster called infrastructure and data. Uh, to which uh, cybersecurity will fall under that. Uh, that is uh, chaired by the Minister of Communications and Multimedia, uh, YB Saifuddin. Uh, so we, uh, we're certainly uh, working on, on that score. And uh, I'll probably call upon uh, my two panelists here to, to be involved in, in that just as well. Uh, you know, can't get any better people to, uh, to get uh, you know, information and uh, ideas from. Thanks. All right. Great. Great to hear that. I'm going to ask something about your own personal opinion, Dr. Falula. Given a choice between putting effort into producing more cy cybersecurity experts or making everyone more cybersecurity aware, where would you balance it? I mean, which do you think is more important? Uh, personally, I think uh, the second is more important. Everybody should be aware. Uh, okay, uh, about cybersecurity as opposed uh, to getting more experts. Uh, the reality is uh, you will never be able to uh, fulfill uh, the demand side, okay? But you can certainly manage the demand. Uh, and therefore, uh, if people are all aware and everybody takes uh, their own responsibility, uh, I'm quite sure uh, we will see uh, a lesser uh, you know, amount of threat uh, uh, you know, out there. I mean, let, let me just take an example. Um, house crime, or, or, or rather uh, house break-ins. Do we expect to see more police outside our house 
or should we uh, manage our own house as best as possible to reduce the possibility of, of a house break-in? And certainly, we need to also take responsibility by making sure our doors are locked, uh, our windows are closed when we're not, we're not home, uh, possibly put uh, an alarm uh, just to, not so much to, uh, to prevent them from coming in, uh, from uh, thieves from coming in, but actually to, is to deter them. So therefore, we will, uh, I think, spending money wisely, if I have only 10 ringgit, I'll spend on getting, making sure people uh, will be more aware about cybersecurity. Yeah, I, I, I get your point. Uh, it's cybersecurity is not about making sure you're never attacked, but making sure you're not an attractive target. Absolutely. As, as someone else who is more <laughs> easier to break into. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now we're going to go a bit individual uh, and, you know, attack some of our guests here. <laughs> so we'll start with you, Abid. Exiata, as you know, in the last couple of years, there have been a lot of, uh, especially since the massive data leak from about two years ago, uh, a lot of people are complaining about increased scam calls, uh, uh, phishing attacks, like you pointed out as well. And they all feel that it comes from the leak of their, uh, leakage of their personal data and numbers. Can you tell us, give us a brief rundown of what the telco industry has done to show up its defenses and make sure something like this doesn't happen again? Sure. So I think if you take three years, take three years ago, uh, there's a lot of things that have evolved globally. Um, and there's a lot of best practices that are starting to settle in. Uh, some of the things that I can uh, share openly is uh, adoption of a world-leading global framework like NIST, which has been utilized not just by in Exiata, but you know, I'm uh, I have good relationships with the CISOs in uh, let's say financial services, the head of CISO in Barclays in based out of in US and so forth. So those adoption of this framework and adopting the maturity year on year, increasing that is number one because that puts us in a same uh, level playing field with our global competitors. Again, I think going back to our MCMC chairman Dr. Falula's uh, view that this is not just about cybersecurity. This is about building that digital trust and in, in building the digital economy. So we've got to get that going. Because if Malaysia wants to be a competitive economy, which is uh, digitally progressive, we've got to make sure we're sort of going above and beyond just understanding basic cyber hygiene, right? So that's number one. Number two, it was really around driving the tone from the top. So again, if I uh, echo back uh, Dr. Fedula's uh, words, uh, it's no more just purely an IT issue. So historically, whenever you talk about cybersecurity, it's always some guy in IT in a back office, you must go and sort it out. Why are you bothering me with this? If you look at where the organizations are, and I can personally speak uh, about Asiada, and if you look at our annual financial reports, there's been a lot of focus. We spent significant amount of uh, resources, management time in discussing this. As far as going to say that even our group CEO, Tansu Jamaluddin's personal KPI has got cybersecurity that's been driven by the board. Uh, and all the CEOs that are in our operating companies have cybersecurity as a KPI. So I think that's similar to cybersecurity Malaysia's budget announcement by the minister. It sets the right tone. It, it gives that sort of impression that we are, to the ordinary employees and everybody in the company, that cybersecurity is important. Uh, and obviously setting up policies, governance structures. So a lot has evolved since the 2017 uh, breach that you are talking about. Last but not least um, is collaboration again. So if you look at, because I don't think my personal view, no one company has answers and are able to defend all the cyber attacks that come to them and all the solutions that are out there. So strong collaboration. If I again go back to using the Asiata's uh, experience over the last three years, we have signed formal MOUs with MDEC, uh, Cybersecurity Malaysia, Nexa. In, in, located from a global context, we are the first and only telco to uh, be part of the first alliance, which allows us to understand what the threats are. So I think it, it, being part of the global search and understanding what is happening, using that knowledge to protect the country and the customers, I think those are some of the developments that I feel has better positioned us now uh, than where we were three years ago. Thank you. Murari, banking. Now everyone is going to have to go digital banking, online banking. I'm pretty sure it has gone up since the, the pandemic happened uh, began. Uh, can you tell us about what, as a consumer or a company, uh, customers have to watch out for when they start going more fully into digital banking? What steps should they take, especially uh, small businesses, to, to make sure that they're not, there's no breach or anything? 
Yeah, I think I think I'll start first with with, with the company's perspective, right? So I think um, one of the things which has sort of uh, changed, um, you know, pre-COVID and and now, is is the scale and acceleration in terms of the technology we are, you know, landing, whether it be to our consumers or, or within the company to the, the the employees itself. And I think you know our mantra has always been, you know, how do we safely deliver that acceleration and and scale. Um, and I think why 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 that's important is that we've had to change our ways of working within security teams. You know, gone are the days where you know we have to we have the time and luxury to sit down and review projects, uh, review initiatives, and take our time to assess them and and provide the approval. Everything is a matter of you know minutes or days or hours, in fact, right? So I think we we've, we've had to deliver a lot of automation in our ways of working to be able to to meet that scale and and digital transformation. So that's one. I think from a consumer consumer perspective, I think the, you know, especially with Standard Chartered, we are are in countries where we've been for, you know, hundreds of years, right? So I think a lot of, uh, you know, older people use uh, very comfortable going to the branches and suddenly they have to pivot to to the online channels and, you know, they're not even digital savvy or digital aware. So I think more to be done on, you know, educating these 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 end users around the risks on on uh, using digital banking. I think the other thing which which has happened is, you know, definitely a lot of uh, heightened monitoring around our attack surface or our external infrastructure, like our VPN connectivities. Um, so that that's something which has happened. And I think um, increase in the amount of simulations we're doing or drills around, you know, are we ready when we get attacked, right? And and what are the different ways we can get attacked? And you know to ensure that our processes and our responses are well oiled in nature, and that includes not just targeting you know IT or technology teams, uh, but also business teams and even the board of directors, right? So um, and and that includes areas such as ransomware, right? Because I think ransomware, uh, you know, attacks and and uh, you know breaches have, have have taken place at a at a worrying scale. But you know something like ransomware involves the whole organization, especially around decision making rights. You know, are we going to pay the ransom or not pay the ransom? That's not a IT manager's decision or CISO's decision. That sits with the board, so they need to be educated and aware of the risk. Um, you know, and when we run these simulations, you realize there are other things involved. For example, with ransomware, you know, um, are we going to hire a professional negotiator? Have we set aside money to do that to to negotiate the ransom? Uh, if we're going to pay the ransom. You know, do we actually have a Bitcoin account? Because it's not a matter of transferring cash. You've got to pay in Bitcoin. So so my point there is, you know, when we run these simulations, it's very important to do so because then you sort of pick out these things which you haven't thought about before, which is on paper. And it sort of allows the organizations to actually be more well-oiled and, and fast in their response to contain any breaches as, as, uh, as much as possible. So these are some of the things we've seen you know, changing, you know, uh, more awareness to the consumer, definitely, where they're not comfortable or not digitally savvy, more heightened monitoring, and, you know, definitely more uh, simulation to enhance the preparedness in the case of any attacks. Okay, thank you. Dr. Farula, I have a very quick question before we open the floor for, or rather the matrix for questions from the audience. Um, You've seen budget uh, going back a bit to the budget, but uh, on in the wake of the budget uh, 2021 announcement, the, one of the ministers also said they are looking at uh, reviewing the cyber laws in this country. You know, I mean, we go back to the Computer Crimes Act, it's 1998, 1996 or something. Yep. Uh, when you meet the minister personally, what advice do you give him? What are the areas and weaknesses in our cyber laws that need to be plugged? The, we always think that uh, the moment we go online, um, it's kind of like a new world. Uh, in reality, it's just an extension of the existing world with a little bit of tweaking here and there. So the laws that we have today, example, our, our PDPA, uh, our Communications Multimedia Act, uh, Computer Crimes, uh, Penal Code, uh, and a few other acts uh, within the security bit, uh, ambit, uh, it's already there. The question is, uh, are these acts... Uh, fit for the period that we are in today. Uh, example, some of the acts uh, may be technology agnostic, but the penalty as a result uh, of any contravention of such act is not punitive enough. Okay, uh, Sometimes you get a, a fine of 10,000 ringgit. Hey, no biggie. I'll just pay and uh, I'll move on. So things like that will have to, to be looked at. 
Uh, and even for uh, CMA, uh, our act uh, was uh, gazetted way back in the year 19... Well, it was crafted in 1998. So that's 22 years down the road. And I'm quite sure internet uh, wasn't what it used to be in 1998 as it, what it is, it is today. And therefore, a lot of things are, are happening. So when we, my conversation with not just my minister, but uh, in, uh, with a few other ministers is that uh, we probably need to sit back revisit uh, what are the new challenges that we see in, the, uh, in cyber security, uh, look at whether we can, uh, do we need new uh, add-ons or amendments to the law, number one. Uh, probably not to create a new law because to try to create a new law will, will just take us a good two years down the road and you know by, the, by then the technology that we are debating about today will have moved on to a different technology and we, uh, it might still not be fit for purpose. But the existing laws are there, uh, we can certainly tighten that and that is something that they are looking at. Uh, they have also talked about uh, creating a commission for cyber security, uh, whether that will uh, be something that uh, will happen or not. Again, we need to revisit uh, how all these acts come into play. Because many of the times uh, the acts falls on different agencies and to you and I as a consumer, we're totally confused. Is, do I go to the police? Uh, do I go to MCMC? Do I go to CSM? Uh, do I go to you know the domestic and trade? Sometimes I just don't know who do I, who do I go to and guess what? I, I'll just stay at home and complain and complain and complain. Uh, on nothing, social media uh, rather. Huh? That, so that will happen. So this is something that we, uh, we have to deal with uh, and uh, to, uh, the lending will probably not be uh, so soon, but certainly the conversation is happening uh, as we talk about. And like I said, having the Digital Economy Council uh, chat by the Prime Minister uh, shapes the discussions that we need to uh, to do and also shapes uh, the areas that we need to refine to make sure that uh, when we do get on board uh, that whole big ship called Digital Economy, uh, we, are, we, we are all better fit uh, to actually uh, make sure that the country moves in the right direction. Okay, thank you. Digital citizens, yeah? Okay, yeah. we have opened the floor for questions. Please, if you have any questions for the gentleman, you won't get them again on the same stage or on the same screen for a while. Uh, we are open to questions from the audience. If you guys have anything to ask, now's the time. Don't be shy. We can't see you. Okay. Uh, while we are waiting for questions to come in, uh, this, uh, can you name one example, Dr. Fadullah, that you'd like to see a change in, in terms of the cyber laws in this country? One small, uh, you spoke about uh, punitive measures, so the quantum of uh, punishment was much less than 10,000 uh, ringgit 20 yep. years ago. It's very different from 10,000 ringgit today. Right. Uh, what other change would you like to see? What do you think is one key element that you'd like to immediately tackle? Uh, okay. When you talk about security and um, uh, trying to regulate, uh, what's important is we must have the ability to regulate. Okay. Uh, today, um, we have a lot of applications over the top, we, uh, we call them. Hmm. And many of them are offering it from out of the country. And many of them are not licensed. And when someone complains, uh, say, MCMC, please take action. How can we? Because uh, they do not fall under our laws. Okay. So one of the things that I, I think we are actually pushing hard uh, is to revisit that law uh, for, uh, come uh, under the Communication and Multimedia Act. How can we actually license people who are serving nations? How do we then protect nations? Uh, mm -hmm. Some countries have taken on what they call as a deeming license, mm -hmm. which means anyone who serves one citizen of a country uh, via online is deemed to be licensed in the country that the citizen uh, is in okay so that way it's kind of a hook it's not perfect but at the very least the law actually has an ability to reach out uh, to those who are serving nations out of Malaysia so that's something yeah. that we are we would like to see it's a very juris jurisdictional issue right yeah uh, we have one question Nurul uh, is asking, what are the simple steps we can do to develop a security culture in the organization, especially amongst non-technical people, uh, beyond just uh, awareness training? I, Murali, can you answer that? Can you take this? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I think the traditional way of you know improving awareness and education needs to definitely change, and we have taken steps as well. I think the traditional approach has been 
when you know people you know don't complete like an e-learning for example you know um you know we always call them out right report them to the line manager and i think what we need to change is rather than penalize people for for just you know bad security behavior we also incentivize good security behavior right because that will motivate people to actually behave in the manner they're supposed to if you actually incentivize it and you can do simple things like you know building leak tables on you know which is the best performing department in terms of security awareness and culture you know definitely something like you know making uh, you know a lot of organizations have mandatory e-learning which is largely centered around code of conduct and ethics you know to extend that to cybersecurity and make that mandatory and and also you know try and look at embedding those into people's job objectives so these are some of the ways to do it but i think you know definitely um you know uh, moving away from just penalizing uh, bad behavior but incentivizing good behavior is definitely a positive step forward and you can see the culture change with that okay thank you uh, dr fadula back to you there's kevin has this question i'm not sure if i understand correctly so i'm going to paraphrase the question uh how does malaysia plan to juggle between cross bar cross border data sharing benefits versus security I mean, a lot of services like you brought up the whole issue of jurisdictions and all that so how does malaysia plan to juggle and you yeah. the challenges I, between uh i think that for that question i i doubt any country actually has an answer all right okay uh, but certainly uh we have to balance there's a lot of benefit on cross border uh, data sharing nobody's going to uh, to say no to that okay but at the same time the data that we are sharing belongs to someone and that someone happens to be be it an organization or an individual in the country now how do we then protect that okay so therefore uh, when you look at from that angle there is always a need to make sure that there is a form of protection uh, by way of law uh, and like in all laws it always stops at the border okay so there will be uh, two levels of uh, if you want uh, approach that the malaysia will uh, should undertake one what's within our border we need to protect people within our border number one number two while we uh, acknowledge that the cross data uh, sharing is important there will always be a g to g arrangement between countries okay and therefore again uh, uh, you have uh, the uh, the trade uh, agreements that you well, we all have and invariably the trade agreements will take in, uh, into account data sharing because that would probably be uh, the way that most economies will go uh, towards in the future okay thank you We've got one final question i guess and because it's you know time's up <laughs> so this one i'm going to paraphrase because it's a long question and i think this one goes to mcmc but uh, our friend from uh, a bit from exiata probably wants to add in a lot of questions i mean uh, going back to again scam calls coming in uh, there are unauthorized mess messages that come in people block them or complain about them the numbers we know belong to a scammer yep. but uh, share from uh, our audience us why isn't the network uh, operators doing something more why are these numbers still in circulation why are these people allowed to make calls uh, from mcmc and say how can we stop this and what do network operators need to do and then okay. i you can answer about what you guys are doing uh, dr farula first okay i think uh, what's what is most important is this okay people assume uh, that numbers uh, phone numbers are the purview of the uh, cellular operators okay they are not many of us are quite happy to uh, to give our data uh, to other organizations uh, I give you an example. I go down to a supermarket and suddenly they say, "Okay, you spend this amount of money. Uh, would you like to enter a contest because you could win a Tesla?" Yeah, I'll put in all my information there, and I wouldn't know who what happens to that information. Okay, so and within the information there will be phone numbers. So, so one, uh, we are quite happy to give our, our numbers away, and therefore that that gives us uh, that provides room for people to use that data to to scam. Second. Uh, there is also a problem with regards to prepaid data registration. Okay, uh, I think the news to, today, uh, I think for the last couple of days, uh, has focused on the efforts done by the uh, Nation uh, Anti-Corruption Commission (MACC), uh, where uh, telco uh, employees, together uh, in cahoots with others, uh, have actually uh, found a way to get numbers, and at the same time, the way prepaid numbers are being registered. 
too uh, has been uh, lax to some extent and therefore we are also taking enforcement so again like i said uh, the problem of numbers uh, do not just uh, stem from one source it is from a variety of sources and what i would advise to people number one if you don't recognize the, uh, the number don't respond okay and if uh, they, uh, these numbers are being used on uh, uh, on uh, platforms such as whatsapp or telegram if you do not know them just block okay uh, and if something gets through to you then certainly do not follow what they ask you to do okay as a bit meant okay. uh, certainly all right so don't be don't be so gullible uh, and last but not least do make a police report okay uh, so that uh, all, when you have the data of reports it allows uh, the uh, authorities to actually undertake investigation because without a report by law no enforcement agency can undertake any further investigation okay, thank you. would you like to add yeah, to me? i think you've covered most of the points the the one point that i would add again to this is this challenge is not just in malaysia i mean if you're following the telco developments uh, even in us with even most advanced spam blocking even there's actually there was a, a strict guidance coming from ftc and they're still having this issue it's simply because as the chairman rightly pointed out some of the issues stem out from some of the platforms that are global platforms social media platforms that have been compromised historically and they, that data is easily available uh, to anybody in the public actually so for me as a scammer to get your details today is very very easy i mean if you can just go to a simple website called have i been pawn put in your email address it will immediately tell you whether you've been compromised or not and you know i, I can share with my personal story here it's really scary my 13 year old daughter knows this website she put my private email address and says that you've been hacked uh, so you are the cyber security expert how did you get hacked <laughs> and then i said to her okay you know why don't you go down and see what happened and obviously i'm not going to mention the the social media companies but those companies were compromised and unfortunately i was part of that social media professional network and so my details whether i no matter what i do in my personal life were compromised too uh, so I think there is an element of that. And of course, there's an element of things that we got to fix. And we're working tirelessly on fixing that too. So I think there's not one simple answer. And I think there's a combination of collaboration between ourselves, the regulators, the technology providers to sort these issues out. But as you, as you should be aware that a lot of the times, regulation is not always the answer uh, because the scammers obviously are more creative than and can move at a faster pace than regulation can ever. So if we are thinking that regulation is answer to all your problems, then I think it's, to me personally, it's not the way you should look at it. So I think I'll pause there, but hopefully that gives you some context. Okay, thank you. We have just one last question then, and this one's for you, Murari, uh, from Kochi. Uh, what has Standard Chartered done to assure stakeholders within the bank and Bank Negara that moving to the cloud does not mean increasing the risk for cybersecurity attacks or data loss? And what about the question of data sovereignty? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, we've done a lot, but, you know, in the interest of time, I think the, the important thing is that, you know, firstly, I think any organization should have a clear sort of strategy around cloud adoption, you know, what exactly they're moving to the cloud. And, you know, my recommendation would be take baby steps in that, you know, potentially, you know, not moving business critical systems or those which hold, for example, PII, PII data for a start, uh, you know, so take baby steps. So potentially, you know, leverage more infrastructure or, you know, platforms for development or, or development environments first. So I think that needs to be very clear in terms of the what exactly is the organization's cloud adoption strategy in terms of, you know, managing the risks and, and the, the compliance uh, uh, aspects of it. I think one thing, you know, everyone needs mm -hmm. to be very clear of if if you were to go and partner with someone like, you know, an AWS or Azure or GCP or Google Cloud Platform, um, you know, the, it is a shared responsibility model, right? Uh, moving stuff to the cloud doesn't mean the cloud provider takes on full responsibility for security. And a lot of these providers have very clear indication of what the responsibilities they take on and what the organization needs to take on. So I think understanding those responsibilities is very clear. Um, we also have in place that before anything gets on border to the cloud, and I'm talking, you know, all flavors of cloud, whether it's infrastructure as a service, platform, or even software as a service, it goes through an extremely robust cloud governance process and onboarding process to assess not only the, you know, security risks, 
but also the um, you know uh, legal and and compliance risks as well. So that process you know cannot be bypassed um, and has to be followed. And and every cloud uh, adoption we go through has to go through that process. So I think putting that in place was very important. Um, and also doing a constant survey of the landscape to see, because this is the enforcement and compliance bit to ensure yeah. that no one has bypassed the process and actually gone and signed up with a software as a service, for example, uh, in that sense. So I think that's really that. I think when it comes to data sovereignty, I guess, I think, you know, when, when you're going and hosting data in the cloud, um, you have to be very clear on where exactly, you know, a lot of the cloud providers have multiple data hosting locations. So you need to ask the question when you're onboarding, where exactly is my data being stored, right? Because where the relationship may be managed from, say for example, Malaysia, uh, so the relationship manager might be there, but your data might actually be in a data center somewhere else. And on that also, I mean, besides where the, the data is being hosted, you know, a lot of cloud providers actually uh, sign on with other partners to deliver services to them. So you know, you move from third party to what I consider fourth party relationships. So even when you find out where the data is being stored, you know, ask the question, you know, are you working with another partner? Because remember, your legal relationship is directly with the cloud provider and you've got to ensure that your, your legal rights extend to beyond the third party. It's sometimes challenging in negotiations. So these are the kind of things to, you know, you need to go in eyes wide open with any sort of arrangements, ask the questions up front, put in a very strong governance and onboarding process. And more importantly, I would say, you know, define what that cloud adoption strategy is and take, a, you know, what I consider baby steps uh, to fully understand what you're signing up for before you start moving production date uh, workloads or, you know, systems which host personal data, um, you know, onto the cloud. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I'm going to give, since Murari, you had the last word in, I'm going to give an opportunity to Abed and Dr. Fadullah here. Yeah? Uh, Abid, would you like to just sum up? Or, uh... no, I think you have, uh, thank you for the opportunity, first of all, and thank you for everybody joining us on a call. You know, if you have anything else, you know, our website has all the information that you need. You can personally reach out to me if it's any Asiata or cybersecurity related matters. Happy to help. Stay safe and, you know, let's keep cyber safe too and COVID pandemic. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Dr. Farula, would you like to add anything? Yeah. <clears throat> thank you all. Uh... Only one uh, a piece of advice, stay safe online, stay safe on offline. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. That's a good way to sign off. So I'm not going to say anything else. Bye, gentlemen. Thank you.